Welcome to another presentation, which is one of the series in the presentations on the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our presentation in this topic is focusing on uh, why the 1888 General Conference session is so important in the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There are many general conference sessions that have been held in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the first one starting in 1863. The last one was held in San Antonio in 2015. And so we've had a lot of general conference sessions but none stands out in its importance and in how or what happened during that general conference as the general conference of 1888. This has remained in the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a landmark event. The summary of it is that in 1888 in Minneapolis uh, General Conference was held, a session was held there, and um, it is regarded as a landmark event in the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and the key participants were Alonzo Jones, Wagner, and it involved a message justification by faith. Ellen White was present, and Ellen White sided with Jones and Wagner, leaving the leadership, in this case, the president of the General Conference, Elder Butler and Uriah Smith, on the other side. The General Conference session also discussed other matters. Let's go into the details. What makes this General Conference a landmark? First of all, the message of righteousness by faith is central to salvation. It is similar to Acts chapter 15 in its context of the discussion. If you would remember in Acts chapter 15, a meeting was called by the apostles at which even the Apostle Paul and Barnabas attended to discuss and provide an answer to a fundamental question raised on salvation. The question was, should Gentiles be required to be circumcised in order to be saved? At the core of this discussion was how is a man saved? That discussion in Acts 15 was so crucial. The Bible says it had intense and heated discussions. But a decision was made, a position taken, and that position communicated to the church. In the 1888 General Conference session, as we will learn, the subject was that of how is a person saved? And that question is central to any discussion on Christian faith. And this 
is what made that general conference a very unique one. Secondly, on the topic of righteousness by faith, central to the uh, question, how is a person saved? The general conference leadership was in the wrong. And that sounds a little bit brutal or blunt, but that's just the plain truth. Thirdly, God used young, non-experienced and outside of leadership circles to bring a message of truth to the church. Ellen White sided with the two young men, an act that resulted in some people doubting her prophetic calling. Ellen White felt humiliated at that meeting. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has never fully healed from 1888. And this is what makes the 1888 General Conference a major landmark point in history. Now, our subject in this presentation is, why is the 1888 General Conference session so important in the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Let's understand the context. The context that brought this entire general conference to such a high climax starts maybe with the formulation of the statement of beliefs as articulated in 1872. The 25 articles that came out in the general conference session in 1872 placed emphasis on works works as the means by which a person is saved. Now we need to keep in mind that as I will share, it doesn't mean there were no statements made about righteousness that comes from God by faith. But the general tenor of even the 25 articles as voted in the 1872 general conference session appeared to place emphasis on works. Secondly, the church at that time was just getting organized as a denomination. And naturally the activities of denominational establishment and organization seems to focus on works, giving the entire body of believers a notion that salvation comes by works. This is a time when the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 were panel beaten and understood well with the third angel message, which called forth for the Sabbatarian Adventists to go and preach the validity of the Ten Commandments, one of which was the Sabbath, whose observance was to serve as a mark and whose observance was to be a sign and whose observance was to play a climax in the end time events. And therefore the emphasis by the church as they preached the three angels messages was to, to tell the world the validity of the 10 commandments in the plan of salvation the validity of the Sabbath, which is within the Ten Commandments, the entire thrust seemed to be that of salvation by works. Remember, this is the time when uh, the health, healthful living message or the health reform message was also being preached. Obviously, the health reform message involved things like do not take tobacco, do not use alcohol, do not use tea, uh, do not use, it, it was a set of things we should not do. Why? So that we may be better Christians and prepare for the second coming of Christ. So the emphasis was on refrain from these things that harm the body so that you may be ready and fit 
to meet Christ Jesus. The entire thrust was on what people should do to be saved. The identification of the role of the Sabbath in the final events and it being a sign was being preached. The desire to prepare for the soon return of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ called forth for people to change, to reform, to be right. No wonder the entire air in circulation was that of what man did to prepare for the soon coming of Christ, what man did to be right, to be fitted for the heavenly kingdom. This is the backdrop. This is the state of the church. And it is during this state of the church that the general conference, or rather that the messages of righteousness by faith that was now being advocated for by these two young people came in. There were two issues that were heated issues at the 1888 general conference. One of which was the law in Galatians chapter three, verse 24, and the entire subject of righteousness by faith in the merits of Christ. Now, what about Galatians chapter three, verse 24? The, 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 the idea is that verse 24 of Galatians chapter three talks about the law as a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. The teaching, the accepted Seventh-day Adventist teaching at that time in the 60s and in the 70s, meaning 1860s and 1870s, is that this law in verse 24 referred to the ceremonial law. Because remember, in verse 25, it says, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. So this verse threatened Adventists because the Adventists thought if the law referred to in verse 24 is the entire Decalogue, the 10 inclusive of the 10 commandments, then it would mean if verse 24 refers to the entire set of the commandments, including the Sabbath, then people will say, we are no longer under the, uh, the supervision of the law, or we are no longer under a schoolmaster, meaning we don't have an obligation to obey these laws. And yet, if we said verse 24 refers to ceremonial laws that were nailed on the cross, then we can say, this verse does not refer to the Decalogue or to the Ten Commandments, therefore they are still valid. And yet, in the teachings by Alonzo Jones and Ilet Wagner, the young men included the entire law in verse 24 and still claimed that the righteousness that came to human beings came from Christ, from God, and it is a gift from God. This was the issue at heart. The second issue was, is it the hands or the alemani that is one of the 10 kingdoms described prophetically in the book of Daniel chapter seven? as it would be discovered when people went to the general conference session, they were actually labeled or categorized in two groups. Those on the side of the church had a position saying that the one of the 10 kingdoms was Hans, 
And yet when Jones had studied history intensely, he came to the conclusion that proposed that that kingdom should be the Alemanni kingdom. Obviously, Uriah Smith, an Adventist most noted prophetic expositor at that time was placed on the defensive side. In his reply to the, what, what the young people were advocating for, it became clear that this was about the position held by the church leadership represented by Uriah Smith and the idea of Jones, which was contrary to the position held by the church. The 1882 statement by Ellen White that I am about to share is intended to say, as far as Ellen White herself was concerned, she was already being shown messages by God that were indicating that salvation is by grace through faith. But that was not the popular voice of the church at that time. Ellen White wrote this statement in 1882. We must renounce our own righteousness and plead for the righteousness of Christ to be imputed to us. We must depend wholly upon Christ for our strength. Self must die. We must acknowledge that all we have is from the exceeding riches of divine grace. Now, this a statement of this kind fell completely on deaf ears when the church was in a context or atmosphere of elevating and calling forth for people to prepare for the soon return of Christ, for people to preach the Sabbath doctrine to the world, for the world to accept. And yet I share this statement because as early as 1882, six years before 1888, Ellen White had been sharing the concept of righteousness by faith, which is, which is imputed by Christ Jesus, which talks about us depending wholly on the strength of Christ Jesus. The principal characters in the 1888 General Conference session were President George Butler, who was the president of the General Conference, and Uriah Smith, who was the chief editor and serving in secretariat at the General Conference. Therefore, you have these two leaders that basically represented the Adventist position and thinking. Keep in mind, both were very influential leaders. Uriah Smith was known as the most noted prophetic expositor of the church to the extent that he wrote books on Daniel, on Revelation, expose, ex giving exposition of the beliefs by the Adventist church. Elder George Butler, on the other hand, was the general who had actually initiated and established evangelistic methods of ministers becoming evangelists to the extent that the growth of the church between 1848 to 1865 is attributed to the great works of this man. On the other side of the camp were Wagner and Jones. And these two will be described. The late Wagner was born in 1855. 
died in 1916. He was a physician and son of an Adventist minister who while attending a camp meeting in California had a vivid impression of Christ hanging on the cross. From that experience, Wagner began studying intensely the doctrine of the sanctuary and the role of the cross in the plan of salvation to the extent that he became consumed with these thoughts. He experienced a deeper level of salvation. He became a preacher of righteousness by faith. And in 1881, he succeeded Elder James White as editor of the Signs of the Times. In 1888, he was only 33 years of old, years old. Now you can imagine, this is a young man, young in age and in faith. But he comes now and has a message to share to the whole church led by elderly people. These were some of the things that were at play. Who was Alonzo Jones? Alonzo Jones was born in 1850, died in 1923. Jones was a former member of the US Army who after deep study of both history and the Bible became a preacher of righteousness by faith. Jones was 38 at the time of the General Conference in 1888, making both Wagner and Jones young people who brought a message that the church was not ready to accept. And yet that message was from God. He was also serving as co-editor of the Science Magazine. Now from a contextual point of view, prior to 1888, these, young, these two young people had begun sharing the messages of righteousness by faith as taught in the book of Romans and Galatians and both of them were actually teaching sometimes even at our college where they were expositing these doctrines and sharing them to the public and in instances even writing in the Signs magazine or Signs of the Times. So essentially, they had spread their teachings before the church authority or authorities approved such a message. Now, leadership upon hearing that there is a message that is threatening the movement, the prophetic movement, the people of the truth. Leadership upon hearing that, Elder George Butler, president at that time, in 1886, formed a nine member committee to study Galatians chapter three, verse 24, and make a report to the church coming from that study. Now, the study of this group, while it was to focus on Galatians 3, verse 24, they studied the entire implications of righteousness by faith. How is a person saved? The point here being a nine member committee was formed to study and bring a recommendation or a report to the larger group. The committee itself of these nine included the GC president himself. It included Uriah Smith, the executive secretary, and it included Wagner. Now, 
these three are part of the nine members. A vote was taken after serious study and the vote was five in favor of the position that verse 24 referred to the ceremonial law and four that it referred to the entire moral law, including the Ten Commandments. Now, look at this. This is nine senior church leaders. And on this important doctrine, they have five who say it refers to the ceremonial law, Four who say it refers to the moral law, including the Ten Commandments. This was serious. As I had stated earlier, the implications, so they thought, is that if this was referring to the moral law, including the Ten Commandments, then the obvious conclusion would be that the Ten Commandments were hung on the cross and are no longer valid. The situation had reached a point of completely splitting leadership and membership. Elder George Butler, seeing a five to four vote contest, decided that this report or this vote should not even be shared with the church because it will send a message that the church is divided. The truth of the matter is the church was divided. Counsel from leadership, take the matter to the general conference session where it will be settled and voted upon. The time had come. The moment was there. It had to go to the highest authority where decisions are made. Keep in mind, the matter is being taken there when the church leadership is split on it and a decision must be made. All members were invited from all conferences and the agenda was passed. They all came, some having listened to Jones and Wagner and having steeped their position in the fact that righteousness was by faith. And on the other side, many delegates came who did not think the church doctrines should come from these young lads, young people who have no experience. The air at the General Conference Session 1888 was tinted with prejudices, steeped in what everybody believed. Unfortunately, the president of the General Conference, Elder George Ad Butler, became sick of malaria and missed the meeting. He could not attend, but he sent a message to Uriah Smith. The message was defend, stand by the old, old landmarks. While absent, the General Conference President sends a message to Uriah Smith and to Morrison, who were both key leaders, and said, stand by the old landmarks. The situation could not be more intense. The officers obviously were Elder Butler and Elder Smith. After much discussions, Jones and Wagner were given the opportunity to articulate the doctrine as they had understood it from scripture, impressed or deepened by God. The church was also given a position to, to articulate a position. In the midst of these discussions, Ellen White, a prophet from God, was present. The eyes were upon her. The church leadership has a position different 
from that of these two young people. And these two young people are threatening the old landmarks of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And here is a prophet who is supposed to hear or to have God communicate to her. And the eyes were on her. And here came a statement. Ellen White strongly endorsed the thrust of Elder Wagner's message, stating that she had seen the truth in Elder Wagner's presentation of righteousness of Christ in relationship to the law. The matter could not have been more intense than it became when Ellen White sided with the two young lads and distanced herself from the leadership of the church. The results, the results were not as was in Acts chapter 15, where leadership together in consultation, the apostle Paul, the apostle James, the apostle Peter, the apostle John, Sensing the Holy Spirit, they all agreed to one position. Gentiles don't have to be circumcised to be saved. Salvation is by grace. A position was taken, a letter written, and communication done to the church. That was not the case. Unlike in Acts chapter 15, where the disciple took a position and an action that was communicated to all, there was no formal vote, either approving or disapproving that was taken. In spite of attempts that were being pushed by the general conference president that a vote must be taken. During the time of discussions, people wanted the general conference president, even though absent, to decide what should happen. And Elder Butler would send messages that simply stated, let a position be taken. The general conference is the highest level where decisions are made. Let them make a decision. You have heard from both sides. But keep in mind, the air was, the air was confusing. The atmosphere was volatile. Both camps were steeped, agitated, and prejudiced taken. Ellen White counseled against. Ellen White blocked taking any action stating this. Ellen White blocked such an action, appealing to the delegates, uh, listen to a quotation from her. The messages coming from your president. <laughs> she calls Elder Butler your president. The messages coming from your president at Battle Creek are calculated to steer you up to make a hasty decision and to take a decided position, but I warn you against doing that. Now, this is a prophet saying these words, and this is a prophet saying these words against the counsel of the head of the institution, the president of the general conference, Elder George Butler. Ellen White made this statement, when no action was taken, but she was, she, because the, the leadership was on the other side and she was on the side of the minority, on the side of the young people, the comments that were made about her were so nasty, so negative, some even reached the extent of calling her that she had become senile. She was no longer receiving messages from God. She wrote this. I have been instructed by God that the terrible experience at the Minneapolis General Conference is one of the saddest chapters in the history of the believers of the present truth. <laughs> 
I have been instructed by God that the terrible experience at the Minneapolis General Conference is one of the saddest chapters in the history of the believers of the present truth. She continued, my testimony was ignored and never in my life was I treated as at that conference. She called it terrible experience, one of the saddest chapters in the history of the believers in the present truth. Yeah. At the general conference session, that's where leaders are elected. So after all these intense discussions on righteousness by faith and on which kingdom is through the hands of the alemany, the church officers were elected. The George Butler was not re-elected. The Uriah Smith was retired. <laughs> tough things, tough things. A new president was elected, Elder A. O. Olsen. Elder A. O. Olsen was not even present at the 1888 General Conference. He was in Europe. The church felt he was a more neutral person who could unite the church, and Ellen White supported the election of Elder Olsen. What are the aftermaths, the things we had to live with after 1888? Uriah Smith in 1890, two years later, confessed his wrong attitude and mistaken position to the 1888 messages of righteousness by faith before the church leadership. Wow. Elder Uriah Smith confessed publicly before church leaders that his attitude was wrong and his position that opposed the messages of righteousness by faith was wrong. In 1893, the old general George I. Butler admitted his mistakes and joined the ranks of those who now recognize that additional light of importance has begun to shine. Can I say hallelujah here? I love it when, when the saints see light and when the saints humble themselves. The elder, the old general called the messages now from Jones and Wagner and Ellen White as additional light of importance that had begun to shine. Others who had opposed also confessed. Among those was Van Horn, Leroy Nicola, and many others. However, some refused to admit that the church was in the wrong. Example, Elder Harmon Lindsay and Frank Belden. <sighs> what was the end of the two? Alonzo Jones and Elet Wagner. History testifies that these two young men were so criticized, so beat up by a lot of people in the church, blamed for having caused the church to go through so much pain, that their end is a sad one. They departed from the faith. They departed from the faith. But Ellen White wrote this about the two. It is quite possible that the Jones or Wagner may be overthrown by the temptations of the enemy. But if they should, this would not prove that they had had no message from God or that the work that they had done was all a mistake. 
she wrote this in 1892, not 1992, in 1892. Reflections, reflections. Number one, due to the emphasis on the validity of the law and the character development, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has always run a risk of being labeled as teaching salvation by works rather than by grace. And this is so even to this day. Adventists are labeled legalists, people who want to be saved by works. I think the reason why I have put this on the reflection is to remind the Adventist body of believers of the history we've gone through, the history of the 1888, where the church recognized that salvation is not by works, it's not by the law. The law points a sinner to the cross, but salvation is by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. The Seventh-day Adventist church needs to remember this for the rest of their history, lest they can recreate an 1888 experience. Sad to say to hold office in the denomination, even the highest office does not make one infallible. All can err. George Butler, Uriah Smith, many others were in the wrong. Position in the office is not equated to being doctrinally correct. I guess I put this as a reflection so that we in leadership may be humbled or carry a humble attitude and be learners from God. Lastly, God is no selector of who he can reveal eternal truths to as long as they are willing to listen. He did it to a 33-year-old man, a 38-year-old young man, a physician and an ex-army officer. That's what makes God so loving. He can pick on anyone who's willing to listen who's willing to take the light. I praise God that the church went through the 1888 general conference session and have been left with lessons for life. Now, you cannot listen to presentations of this kind and not want to listen to more. That's my hope, of course. So please, Go ahead and subscribe to this channel so that you will get more of my recordings in the future.